Coming at you all the way from Arbitrum, it's the Magic Hour Podcast. This is Alan. Dionysus. And Breaker. Produced by Digital Strategies Guild. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Magic Hour podcast. We're happy to have Garp from Treasure Dow join us this afternoon. But before we get into the episode, I briefly want to mention that our friends have developed an amazing automation tool. Right now, you can set up automated transactions for claiming your magic emissions from the Atlas Mine. And very simply, you just set it and forget it. It even works with hardware wallets. And thanks to Chronologic, the name of this product, the first 50 Magic Hour pod listeners to sign up will get 200 free credits, meaning you can set up 200 transactions. And in order to do so, you're just going to navigate to chronologic.network slash magic hour pod. Again, that's chronologic.network slash magic hour pod. And this will also be in the show notes and on Twitter. And let us know, give us some feedback about what you think of the project. But enough about that. You know, we can talk about that another time. Garp, we're happy to have you here. Welcome to the pod. Yeah, great to be here. Love your work. Thank you so much. We, we love hearing that. It makes us feel good, but we're, we're doing it all because we're interested in you guys. But I'm going to turn it over to Dion now because Dion's with us as well. Dion, take us away. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much, Garp, for taking time out of your day to join us on the pod. I'm sure our listeners and ourselves are uh, just extremely thankful. So to kick off the interview, uh, one of the questions that we really like to start with is what was your journey into crypto? Uh, what got you excited about it and how did you find it in the first place? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, like uh, many people back in the, the day, you know, one of their friends or colleagues kind of told them about him. Uh, <laughs> but like many others, I was a, a tattoo kind of occupied with my in real life uh, work. So, you know, I think this was around the time of maybe the ETH kind of ICO or just after someone was telling about, you know, the notion of smart contracts, kind of if this, then do that kind of thing. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, cool, sure. <laughs> that sounds interesting, but I, I was quite pumped. Obviously, I regretted that decision <laughs> a lot <laughs> after the fact, as many people do. Uh, but then it wasn't really until 2017 that um, I kind of got stuck in again, like probably early to, to mid-2017. And it kind of, I guess, was a little bit of an overlap with a tiny bit of a lull in my kind of work. So I had a little bit more time to kind of dive uh, a little bit deeper. And I think like others, um, you know, once you go down the rabbit hole, you kind of don't come back out again, so to speak. And I think, you know, ever since then, um, I've kind of been <laughs> kind of stuck on it, I guess. Can't get away from it. Uh, I think just like the, the notion of what it was trying to achieve, like back then, um, like just principle-based was really interesting to me. I guess obviously BTC, but then um, ETH, just in terms of uh, what it kind of opens up. I guess like many others probably got stuck in on, um, oh my God, it's going to change the world kind of thing. Like everyone does. And then you kind of realize, well, wait a minute. Um, actually pretty much most things in 2017 was just a vapor, <laughs> um, but you kind of got stuck into that world, right? I mean, my background is like corporate strategy, kind of strategy consulting. So kind of wanted to bring this more like business model type um, thinking to a lot of this stuff. So was less technical um, from that kind of aspect, but you know, definitely from a, um, just like how might this actually work in practice? So then as you kind of dive a little bit deeper into it, um, that kind of was what kind of piqued my interest. Obviously, we're super early uh, in 2017, and, and we all kind of know how that ended up for, for most projects. But it was a, a wild ride. Um, you know, I had done you know, various forms of, I guess, investing prior to that. But I think like with many things, like one cycle in crypto is like a decade in a traditional um, in a traditional market, so I, I went through the the cycle of our sleepless nights <laughs> that that everyone <laughs> that everyone went through. It was it was fun though. It was fun. Yeah, I get those sleepless nights sometimes too. Mostly about you know whether things are going to crash while I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I had that in 2017. Surprisingly, like now, um, like you know, given UST uh, and the collapse of that, like even though it's probably like the single largest like unwinding <laughs> in the history, just from a magnitude side. It has affected me the least and I'm like least worried about it. Uh, I think mainly because just like of how far the industry has come. And I think also just like now versus back then, like being a builder is quite different. So just focused on doing what we do, like nothing fundamentally has changed. It obviously, you know, added scrutiny from regulators uh, was something that was going to happen eventually. This kind of just accelerated that. Not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, fundamentally it doesn't really change what we're kind of building. So I've, I've kind of been at peace, so to speak, or maybe I'm just numb to the pain. I'm not sure. <laughs> I would almost say for me, it's the latter because, you know, I've, I've been in this space since like 2013 or so, kind of since, you know, Bitcoin and all that. 
and you know going through all these different crashes and the volatility i think it, that's exactly what it is you just become numb to it and different and you're like it is what it is you know like it was never anything to begin with so if this is it it's it but at the same time you know there's a lot of belief behind what we're doing and and what you guys are doing really because you're the builders we're just you know commentating on it but i think that it's got a lot of poten- future potential that just you can't ignore Re- regulators or not yeah i think like the one of the biggest things outside of like actual capital coming in is just the talent coming in as well um so unless it's just like the the biggest like ponzi of all time like people very very brilliant minds are coming in it's actually it's this kind of like dichotomy of you get the people who are like the furthest left curve that you'll ever meet and then mm-hmm. <laughs> the furthest <laughs> kind of right curve as well kind of all uh, right. converging in one spot like that meme of the of the bell curve is very true <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and so you you i don't know it's kind of weird you get a, a real hodgepodge of people but it's uh it's quite interesting i it's hard because of this whole work from home i'm now like quite isolated mm-hmm. like I, I don't go out uh, as much like anywhere near as i used to so i kind of live with all my uh, discord anons and twitter anons it's, it's somewhat like a little bit sad that I'm, I'm living um like all those memes of like the guy in the the you know either <laughs> um the basement or the um you know the attic kind of staring down right it's right, like, right. <laughs> um, the, the party <laughs> guy who's is standing by himself and they don't know that i'm the <laughs> ceo of a big <laughs> Tw- uh, treasure Dow project. <laughs> please, please, sir, tell me about this yeah. magic coin that you have. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like, y- yeah, you know, it's, y- it's funny. It, it is funny, and I was actually commenting to my friend the other day. I, I feel like some sometimes I go weeks without interacting with someone in person. You know, like yeah, you go to the supermarket and stuff like that, but you know, like I interact more with uh, Dion and Alum and. You know, all the uh, DGENs in our discords sometimes than I do, you know, with like the outside world. You know, I think that's also kind of the, I don't know if I want to call it the uh, proof of concept for the metaverse, but I think it's just kind of indicative of where we're headed. You know, like I think that, you know, the whole idea of this, the metaverse is kind of bringing all that to the forefront. Like whether we're communicating online or in person, we can have it all. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I mean, like, metaverse is just one of those, I guess, tropes that people have kind of spoken about, like one of the um, buzzwordy type things. Like, we use it, I know, um, unfortunately. But it's just one way that people kind of anchor on a concept of, like, digital adoption, essentially. Like, people just spending more time uh, digitally than they do in real life. Uh, yeah. But then even just like, a, you know, what we're doing now, you've obviously got your camera on, but just um, it's part in real life, part digital, but you can still see someone um, and it's a spectrum. Um, but I think, you know, over time, as we can start to form like deeper connections with people like this, it'll just become normal. Um, and, you know, metaverse won't really be a thing that we call metaverse anymore. It will just be kind of way of life, I suspect. And th- I think the other part of it is just like, uh, you know, when people kind of go digitally, it's nearly an escape. It's like part of escapism. Uh, you right. can kind of tap, like particularly with games, you can kind of tap into this world that, you know, your real person can't do. You create this character, maybe you want to create, you know, the opposite gender or whatever, or like this crazy dude that's like completely opposite to you. And that's completely fine. And you can have many different, um, you know, manifestations of, of that. And that's, I think, the, the really cool thing uh, mm-hmm. about it. And um, like the popularity of, of games allowed to do that, I think, is probably just uh, a little bit of a flavor for, um, I suspect, where we we'll probably end up um, when we're very old. maybe so maybe so i hope so so i assume you know based on what you're saying that you are full-time web3 for treasure any other projects that you um are working on within the web3 space or outside the web3 space um so yeah i i left my kind of real life job um at the back end of last year i think like others you know working from home kind of gave me some freedom um to kind of uh you know work two jobs for a while but that became untenable like very fast uh, it was kind of crazy, uh, the hours, um, and I've just got a, I've got a small child as well, and it's, uh, it's quite hard to kind of look after um, a family as well while trying to do that. So made that kind of leap. In terms of Web3 itself, I think like there's no real other like core thing outside of Treasure, outside of probably like Toadstools, um, where I do kind of spend some time kind of advising on that. You know, that's kind of connected into um, to Treasure anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Outside of that, you know, I do definitely kind of speak to to others in other various kind of projects, but nothing I would say like. Um, you know, meaningful such that I'd be, you know, part of the team or anything like that. So, um, yeah. 
nothing kind of major. Uh, it's hard enough as it is just to kind of wrap my head around uh, what's happening in, in Treasure. So. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. And, and I don't think anyone blames you there either. Dion? Yeah, no. Uh, now that uh, Web3 has kind of like assumed uh, 100% of your attention and, and Treasure has as well, are, a question I have is, are you fully anonymous? Like, does the Treasure team know who you are? Are you doxed to them? Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely doxxed to, like, I guess, members within the Treasure team. I mean, the, the genesis of me being, you know, a non originally was because I was, like, working two jobs. I <laughs> didn't want mm -hmm. uh, the, the in real life uh, work to, to know. I was doing a little bit of moonlighting, but um, I guess it's kind of extended on there. I think the, the one thing that I'm, you know, still grappling with is that there are still uh, lots of crazies in Web3. Like, I mean, there's lots of crazies everywhere, but definitely in Web3. And whenever you're creating something where there's money involved, people do really silly things. And you no, know, I've got a family and I'm not sure I necessarily want to expose them to said um, individuals. So I'm still trying to think through like, if I was to, to dox at some stage, how I would do that in a responsible way. Because it's not just like myself that I need to think of, it's, it's others as well. Uh, and you no, know, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be doing any kind of bad things, but it, it could just mean uh, you know, like, let's just take it's a down market right now, right? There's loads of people down bad, uh, could have nothing to do with what we're doing, but they may blame us and, you know, they want to go after certain individuals. So I, I just need to kind of bear that in mind um, with, with that kind of thing. Hey, that, that, that's a great take, honestly. And, you know, I think, I don't think we've had many Anons on this podcast before, but I, I really appreciate that uh, insight because that makes a lot of sense and you're absolutely right there are a lot of bad actors in this space i was actually trying to buy an N nft nyc ticket uh and the guy was like all right i'll sell you one for six hundred dollars and i was like okay cool can i pay for eat pay with eth and he's like yeah sure and i'm like okay so how do we do this where i don't send you the eth and you don't send me the ticket you know all right and you <laughs> <Encrypted>. know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. and he's like well just trust me and i'm like but no way. No. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Yeah>, funny. <laughs> absolutely. No, I, I, I totally get it. Like being in this space, one of the first things that attracted me to it was the fact that you could be completely anonymous. And that was that was like a, a bastion of, of crypto more, more generally. And it, it, it's funny to see how some people uh, have still have uh, kind of preconceived notions or aversions to people that are completely anonymous, thinking that they're inherently shady or other things like that. But as you mentioned, there are plenty of other reasons like security that you wouldn't want to, to dox yourself or, or have any inclination of who you are in the real world. I think um, probably the other thing that I just want to kind of comment on as well, like having come from like a corporate background and worked, um, you know, in a professional sphere for a while, like I just like some commentary on like a lot of punters in this space. I just do generally feel like a lot of them just have no experience whatsoever in business um, or any sort of commercial aspects. And so their expectations on anything remotely logical in the business world is um, like outrageous, to be honest. And like the commentary um, from people and the expectations on founders, like it's a little bit of give and take. Look, there's loads of scammers out there, so it, it's hard to know. But at the same time, like if you don't give people the freedom to actually try to create something and you just, you know, um, basically send them to the, the, the lashes because, oh, I started a project and it failed. Therefore, like you're the worst in the world and you can never do anything right. ever again. You, you rugged like, us. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, and rug is a term that people just like to use, you know, one as a meme, but then two, like it has a very specific term uh, and meaning to it. It's like you literally took the funds and you left and you didn't do anything, right. which is different to like you actually tried to make this work and then it, it didn't work. So then what do you do? Like in a normal circumstance, you run out of money and there's unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. Like the mm -hmm. investors don't get anything and then you kind of move on and not because you're rugging them, it's because you like you literally tried and it didn't work. So does that mean that person can no longer do anything again in the space? Well, no, right? That's not really how the real world works. Um, and I'm not sure, like, that's definitely not how Web3 works because you'll find that, like, as you dig deeper, like, Web3 devs are working across multiple projects at once. And you, mm -hmm. as you saw with, like, multiple others, um, the guy from uh, kind of Zuki, but that's, like, really common, right? Like, a lot of these devs have worked across, like, more projects than you would ever imagine. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. A lot of it comes down to intent, in my mind. Um, like, are they kind of nefarious malintent to begin with? And it's hard to know. Um, right. But there, there needs to be like a little bit of a playing out with this. And I guess in some ways, the, you know, the sophisticated investor um, regs, even though they're very crude, it's like, oh, you got more money, therefore you're smarter. Obviously, it doesn't really work like that. But like we need some way to help filter that because if you're just getting people who've got literally no idea um, and they're just applying their, oh, I'm down bad, therefore like, you know, you're rugging me. 
it's going to kill the space. Right? You're not going to get the innovation that you need um, at all because people are going to be too scared to do anything because they're just going to get raked over the coals for any ounce of failure when we all know like most startups fail, um, small businesses fail. So it's, it's a big learning process. Um, but I think people in the industry who, are not, who don't come from traditional business background like, need to have a little bit of a reality check is my personal opinion. And I think that you're absolutely right. I think that there is a level of professionalism that some people have and some people don't. And I, I come from a corporate background myself, so I, I can respect that and I understand what that means. But, you know, in the discourse that I hang in, they're, they're like teenagers and, you know. I actually think like the, one of the biggest changes we're going to see is um, KYC mm-hmm. onto all the exchanges and DeFi. I think going to change, change up the dynamic of who actually participates uh, in these markets. Um, like pretty significantly over time. I agree with you, but I don't think, I think that there's somewhat of a limit there, right? You, we're still going to have the quote unquote dark regions of Web3 where you won't have to, to KYC and you'll just interact outside of that. You're not going to prevent everybody from, or excuse me, I should say not everybody is going to KYC and those who don't are still going to figure out a way to participate in the space. Yeah, for sure. I, I think governments will come down a lot heavier, though. Um, it's going to mm-hmm. be very hard for people to get their money out um, right. of the system um, and even into the system. And then anyone who's got like any form of business, registered business in a particular jurisdiction, or if you need like a, an access point in, um, you're going to find, I suspect, very challenging to, to do anything uh, over time. I, I know like most of the, the diehard crypto people um, are going to say, oh, that's really bad. But, you know, um, there is some good and bad to that. Um, but it, oh, yeah. it, was al- it was always going to come. It was always going to come. I, I agree. I agree with you. And, you know, it's, it's only a matter of time, but that's okay. I'm not, I'm, personally, I'm not too concerned. I have, I have a very kind of weird outlook for Web3, which is counterintuitive, I think, to most, which is that, to me, the transparency in Web3 is the value in it. And I don't care about hiding anything. Um, you know, like I have my own, well, it's not my full name as my ETH address, but it's close enough to it. And I'm like, so what if you could see what I do? I don't care. You know, I think that you, there's either, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, you can have full transparency, you can have full privacy, but you can have some hybrid model. And I think full privacy is completely off the table at this point. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to kind of get to that level again, but maybe we will. Who knows? So I just think that full transparency is the way, but that's a, a topic for a different conversation. You know, we're here to talk about treasure and, and NFTs and, you know, like what, what projects were you interested in prior to NFTs, if any, you know, you talked about ICOs and, and that, what kind of was like, cause you know, NFTs, at least for me, kind of really caught my interest in the beginning of 2021 between 2017 and then you know there was a lot of other stuff going on yeah it was funny like in 2017 you know when i was still trying to feel my way through uh, i actually saw like gaming as like one of those big verticals at the start so at the time um i was kind of looking at uh so wax i'm not sure if you're kind of familiar with that and so um they had like really kind of deep roots into kind of the cs uh, go kind of secondary market um of items uh, and trying to bridge that gap now, I think like one of the things I kind of learned early on was that, you know, the guy who was running that was like an ex-corporate guy, but there's, you know, a bit of hit and miss with that because you kind of get the people who are trying to retrofit everything into a corporate world, but it's not really that native um, kind of Web3 versus those who, you know, truly try to adopt what it is. Um, and so there was that or kind of engine, which I'm sure you're kind of familiar with, um, which, you know, went <laughs> kind of multiples. They did, uh, you know, fantastic job. I think they were much closer to the Minecraft community um, from memory back then. And so I was quite interested, but, um, uh, you know, back in 2017 uh, on just like the how we kind of break into gaming, but we were so early, so early on, like there was just no infrastructure really back then. Um, and then like, I think obviously uh, most people were, were kind of focused in on just you know, L1 <laughs> kind of equivs. Uh, that's kind of where a lot of the kind of the value was. Um, and that's where like the, a lot of the narratives were kind of built around. And that was kind of the early days. And I think like over time, you know, we obviously went through 2018, 2019 kind of bear that was uh, pretty long and protracted. So I kind of left my job the first time to kind of start a couple of things with, uh, with kind of friends uh, in kind of the blockchain space. That was kind of more on the kind of consulting side. Uh, and that's just because I had a couple of friends and then, you know, had a background in that. And I could only do that for as long as my, uh, you know, family circumstance kind of permitted. Um, and then I had to kind of, you know, go back into the, the real world. But I was still, you know, had eye on kind of crypto, but not, not as closely as I probably would have liked. And then I definitely was kind of uh, much heavier again before the March collapse. 
Uh, so it was kind of on and off, but not as much as I could have would have liked to. And then definitely during DeFi summer uh, was like relatively kind of involved. So um, uh, was a big fan of kind of like Rari. Uh, if you're kind of familiar with them, uh, um, kind of decentralized kind of loan, they use kind of the um, compound kind of protocol to kind of build that out. Um, so that was kind of one. Uh, the other one was kind of BadgerDAO, uh, more around like onboarding Bitcoin um, onto kind of ETH. Um, obviously, they've gone through like different waves, but they're, they're still around. Um, I did kind of get into kind of, I guess, the, the own wave originally, like when it first was there, like the <laughs> into, into the meme um, itself. But I mean, what they were trying to achieve, like, and what they did achieve through protocol owned liquidity and bonds is like a really uh, elegant kind of product. I think, you know, we've taken it an extra step further with balance of crystals. Um, kind of gamified liquidity. Uh, it's a lot more capital efficient. Now, obviously, it's probably a little bit harder to do that in a, you know, as a service, although we probably could explore that. You know, uh, gamified liquidity as a service might be an interesting one to explore. It's really capital efficient as well. Like you're actually not emitting any tokens um, at all. I love the whole idea of the balancer crystals, both, you know, in a way where it's like, not only are you giving, are you utilizing liquidity pools as a component to the game itself, but you're basically collecting the liquidity pool assets for your own treasury. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And and just this, this whole notion of like abstracting away the complexity of what liquidity is and what an LP is, because we all know like DeFi is just really complicated. Um, and, you know, even people immersed in this space still struggle um, to understand like how that works properly, uh, let alone newcomers. So. I think that was kind of the other thing that I, I really wanted to kind of bring to the space as well, which is like helping to kind of simplify to, to the masses ways that you could get and get involved in kind of Web3 and crypto. So you know, focusing back in on like the underlying product, uh, what actually makes things tick, like what are the actual needs that people were, were trying to solve for um, and go back to kind of, you know, first principles in that sense. So less focusing on, oh, we've got this amazing technical aspect because really no one cares about that um, at the end of the day, like if you're trying to reach mass, reach mass market. We're just trying to create a, a delightful experience. I know Trevor, Treasure, like, inherently is complicated and it's complex. So, like, we totally get that. Uh, and Bridge World, as you would have seen, is complicated as well. Um, I guess in some ways it's, it's kind of stuck in between a couple of places because, you know, one, it is, you know, it is a game in a sense, like it's gameplay, but at the same time, it's also plays a very specific role within the Treasure ecosystem in the sense that, like, it's nearly this economic layer, um, that kind of connects the other cartridges into. And so having that, one function as it's meant to, to kind of balance the supply and demand. Um, one within Bridgewater itself and then two within the other games that plug in. And then two for it to be fun for users, uh, is quite hard. And, you know, Peter and Anne do an amazing job so far. And, you know, they're very thoughtful in what they do. Uh, and I know lots of people are like, oh, I want you to do XYZ now, but you know, it's very hard. I think anyone who's been in a real business knows that it takes time. Um, you need to observe the data before you make any rash decisions. There's always going to be, you know, quotation mark winners and losers for every patch update, so to speak. But, you know, just give them time to um, actually speak to people, um, observe the data, get a fuller understanding of like how it actually plays out before, you know, I guess casting judgment, so to speak. Because uh, you kind of don't forget, uh, sorry, you don't, you know, don't realize that Bridgewater's only been around for what, like a couple of months. <laughs> and Garp, one of the things that you, you mentioned was you worked kind of like as a consultative partner um, in some projects in, in like the 2018, 2019 years. Could you talk a little bit about either some of those projects or maybe one of your favorite ones that you had an opportunity to kind of make an impact on? Yeah, I mean, it was quite different in terms of like the work that we were doing back then. And it was mainly yeah, focused course. on um, like Southeast Asia. So okay. Can't really disclose like too much back then, but like it was That's mainly fair. focused on like, you know, uh, like the Indonesia, Philippines uh, and Singapore region. Uh, and that's mainly because we had like some members in our team were like very plugged into that network. And so like I'm obviously from Australia, so I don't really have any connections uh, into there. So we're kind of just leveraging that because it's it was a highly competitive space back then. Uh, and so we're just trying to get, you know, I guess a little bit of uh, runway into uh, some traction on the board uh, with clients. Now, as you kind of will remember, most of those projects did not go so great. And for a number of different reasons. One, like just product market fit was nowhere near <laughs> where it needed to be. And I think that was probably the other learning line. And you know, reflecting on it, probably should have known just based on like my in real world life kind of experience with this stuff is that it's really hard to get that product market fit uh, with a highly experimental technology. And like blockchain at that time, just was nowhere near to be ready to be adopted at any scale. Uh, and particularly any means where you actually required like a native token to be the form of currency um, for that. There's just no way, particularly like some of the things that we were working with were kind of B2B and like, you know, 
people just won't want to transact. Like they hardly want to transact in BTC or ETH. And even stable coins weren't really a big thing back then either. Like uh, Tether was the biggest one back then. Yeah. And even then there was a lot of scrutiny as there is still to this day um, around the use of that. Uh, and then as soon as you go into like the volatility of any of the majors, notwithstanding like, and then you go into the alts, I mean, it's, forget about it. It was, it was just incredibly hard to get people across that. Like, even now it's quite hard, but like back then it was impossible. So that, that was kind of one of the big learnings, I think. Product market fit is, is very real um, and it's like overlay technology on top of that. And it's just, it's another kind of axis that you need to be very, um, but when we approach things, we always try to take that kind of, um, you know, that angle to it. It's like, do you actually need a token for this? Uh, and you kind of need to rigorously test that out. Um, and it's hard not to kind of fall within the trap of like groupthink because like invariably that's kind of what happens. And look, you know, our own discord kind of falls into that trap as well um it's as no do way. most discords I've been, I've been boys they're not like that at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's uh, it, it's hard and uh, i think treasure probably due to a success um we fell into that now like at the start we had this amazing like evangelism uh and really passionate community that it really helped us um propel us to exceptional heights that we never had even dreamed of like in the early days but you know co- with that comes a lot of the i guess the dangers of that which is like i guess overconfidence is that kind of, uh, you know, that saying is that uh, around kind of technology adoption, like we've got, I think we be- I, like, I believe that we have the right thesis. It's just around timing uh, and timing matters a lot for technology adoption. Definitely. And, you know, I guess the one thing that I would say that I'm really grateful about in this space specifically with magic, and I, 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 I mean this, is that there, there are just so many people building there are so many different projects and, you know, whether or not they all make it is irrelevant because I think that statistically speaking, there are going to be enough projects that do make it for this ecosystem just based on the number of people that are building right now. Uh, that's yeah, well, the way I, I kind of like am taking the approach to it. Well, I think even like yourselves, right, creating this podcast um, and creating um, like, you know, supporting materials and education around it, I think is a... I think a testament to um, to people's uh, interest and kind of conviction um, in it. Uh, we are we are a reflection of like the the builders and the community around us. So, um, you know, for as long as we're creating enough for you, for people like yourselves to to still be interested uh, in creating content and helping us build this out, I think like, I think we're going in the right direction. Um, it's just, you know as soon as we start losing um, people like yourselves, maybe like disinterest, although, you know, notwithstanding life changes happen and the macro market's looking a tad shaky, um, to say the least. Um, so totally understand that. But yeah, we need to kind of keep engaged with, um, with, like, with builders and uh, contributors such as yourself. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. Every day we kind of see uh, someone new uh, or someone kind of approaching us with, with building something new. So it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome to see that. It definitely is. You know, not to be like uh, super detectives or anything, but we, you know, we wanted to figure out what what can we find out about Garp, and we you know we searched through some of your tweets, and we we learned that uh, early September you first tweeted about Treasure. Were you part of the Treasure team at that point when you had first discovered it, or was it something that kind of happened organically where you just like oh I want to be a part of this? How you know how do I get involved? Who do I reach out to? Kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure about the specific date, but I wasn't part of the original team, um, so I think I must have joined maybe within the first week or so. And so I think I've told this story a couple of times, but it was around the loot kind of derivative craze uh, and um, being uh, a degenerate, I kind of bought first, ask questions later. <laughs> and, <laughs> as we all do. Yeah. As we all do. Um, some paid off, some <laughs> did not. They went straight to zero, but that, that's fine. Um, you, you <laughs> it kind of comes with the territory, so to speak. But of course. I guess, you know, I actually became the meme on this. Like I literally, uh, I bought the top, joined the, um, joined the Discord, uh, became a community member. I was like, okay, well, I better find out a little bit more about what they're actually doing. I mean, Loot was definitely very interesting in terms of what it was trying to become, like very bottom up, like obviously just the, the craziness around it, um, around the prices and then uh, like the, the speed at which the narrative picked up, like the VCs jumping on board and just the money that piled in was uh, like very characteristic of crypto really. But kind of coming into treasure just like throwing around a couple of thoughts around how we could kind of take it uh was pretty interested just in like the the resource first model um you know the notion of kind of social coordination uh around something that has like value from kind of day one um but just trying to prove that out as a model um and then i ended up speaking to kind of like john and utah at the time like back then uh and then like the rest is kind of history i kind of 
joined the team, like one of the first things I did was helping uh, stop people insta dumping their tokens back when everyone was farming um, a thousand magic a day with N uh, and all the other things. So that, that was like task number one. What is the, the token sync that we need? Uh, and then like the second thing was um, how people got their legions to begin with, uh, which was the original single status staking. And so I was working predominantly on just like all things kind of liquidity, um, the token economics um, to begin with. That's kind of definitely evolved over time. I was doing like a lot of the partnerships kind of set up like the Olympus Pro uh, protocol and liquidity was like a big thing. Obviously working with like, uh, you know, John and co on kind of building it out, but um, that's kind of what I did at the start. Uh, but now we've got, um, fortunately we've got uh, like <laughs> Peter on board, who's uh, far smarter than I am on, on all those kind of things. So we can kind of ta tap into his expertise uh, on that front. Definitely. When you made the choice to like join the team, was it, was it based on, like, Anything that John in particular said, what was your first interaction with him like? Was he charismatic enough to kind of win you over? Were you trying like to claw your way into the, the treasure team in any way? What was that interaction like? Uh, I think it was pretty, um, like there was no real intent at, at, at the start when I was there. I mean, I had always wanted to kind of work in Web3 in one way, shape or form. I just hadn't quite figured out what that would look like. I think like a lot of people... No, I'm not a technical person. I'm not a developer. And so trying to find your way in from the outside looking in uh, is a very technical space. can be a little bit con confronting, but you kind of just need to boil it down into, like, into the various component parts to, to kind of get stuck in. Uh, and being part of the community and contributing is uh, just the, the way that most people say to get, kind of get involved. And this was just one of those projects that had enough interest at the start um, where I felt like I could add some value to that, uh, to the conversation and to help kind of move things forward. I wouldn't necessarily say there was, you know, it was any individual, like it wasn't necessarily John or like anyone at the time that kind of drew me in, but it was like, I guess, collectively where I was trying to go like off the back of like a loot riv, um, like the notion of where it was trying to go. I could see like a lot of potential there. They hadn't really latched onto the gaming aspect of it that much um, to begin with. It was still very much like DeFi oriented, um, but I could see the potential of where you could take it. And so like from there, it's like, well, okay, this is a bit of an open book. Um, and so if we play this right, um, it could be quite large. Um, and that was quite attractive from that sense. For sure. It's, it really sounds like you just kind of meshed with the vision and really wanted to pursue that with a group of like-minded individuals. And I feel like that's oftentimes the best fit. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, and then, you know, you speak to people uh, and then like culture is a massive thing. Uh, and it's actually one of the hardest things to establish uh, in crypto, I think, because like, you miss that in real uh, life kind of connection with people. Uh, it could be as simple as, I know, ironically, I don't have my camera on, but it could be as simple <laughs> as having your camera on yeah, yeah. Um, to form those connections. Um, so, you know, chatting to people on message only takes you so far. Even chatting to people um, on voice um, without seeing their face only takes you so far. So it's definitely been one of our biggest challenges in scaling um, is forming that like real team culture. Uh, and we've, we've tried to put in place some of the funner activities to get to know each other more um, that you would have, like if you're in a traditional Office 6, you know, environment, just so we can actually understand, understand each other better as individuals. Um, and like, I think a lot of the time you get that through like Discord channels uh, when you spend a lot of time together. But, you know, we're just trying to get that into a really good spot such that we can get the, uh, the working environment uh, into a really good place. To, to go down that thread just a little bit more, that that sounds exceptionally hard, not not only for the reasons that you just mentioned, but also you're working with like a global team. You're working with a team uh, like you're in Australia. I think End and PETA are also in Australia. John's in, in the US. You have other members that are kind of scattered around, like not only just like having the ability to like jump on camera, but also just like time zones and having coming from different cultures as well. Yeah, I, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> that's tough. hundred percent. I mean... I hadn't even uh, thought um, that much about like the actual people's actual culture, <laughs> yeah. the background they come from, because you never actually know. Yeah, <laughs> it's really hard to tell. Yeah, um, it's a bit of a, a black box, but yeah, it's exactly right because it, it. I mean, it really does inform um, how people kind of think. Uh, it, like it's um, the the nature aspect of people's background is um, very informative of, of of how they kind of operate. But it's been incredibly challenging. We have like a truly global team across like nearly every major time zone all over the world, working async can only get you so far. Uh, people invariably are working at ridiculous hours because it's the only time you can actually get each other in the same time zone. 
so that that's pretty challenging and then just not really knowing each other the way that you want to know each other to make this as you know well oiled as you'd want to make it is it's really hard as well so you know having 30 plus people in a truly global team where you know for the most part they are kind of anon um in a very like functional form like you mm -hmm. actually don't really know them as a person yeah. it's really hard to do so like there's no such thing as a like you can't go for drinks or like the equivalent of a night out <laughs> yeah. to get to know people it's it's pretty hard we've got like gaming nights and events which has actually been really fun but you know that uh, we're trying to get there we're trying to get there but it, it is really hard um but what games do you guys play on gaming nights the the most popular one so far has been quake nice <laughs> so we've wow. we've found this um Throwing it back <laughs> yeah. yeah i it know back. <laughs> <laughs> we it's probably a you know it reflects our age um somewhat <laughs> but uh we're trying to find like just something super simple and we uh i think it must have been atline um he's amazing by the way he, he does so much stuff on like the the back end of um of Gun and Trove. but like i think he found uh this like really lightweight version of quake that everyone can play it's like a browser based um and it has its own kind of server such that you can like turn voice on although you can just turn it on on slack anyway um, right. and so yeah, no, we, we try to play that. Um, we get absolutely wrecked. Cheese is a master apparently. <laughs> um, he was on like 400 ping and he was just like absolutely wrecking everyone. So. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. Having, um, playing games while on different servers is also fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can imagine. So wow. yeah, that, that's been the, the main one that we played. We did play some Smash Carts as well, just like the first iteration, just cause that, like, that was just the thing that we knew people could play. Uh, so, so Maxime was just like wrecking everyone on that. Um, and so we're just finding like people are just, you know, these uh, actual like gods of these games. <laughs> They're not telling us about, but yeah, it's fun. It's, it's just like a, a nice way to kind of um, tap into what is essentially like at the core kind of very treasure as well, right? Like we're, um, a lot of us are big gamers. Um, and so like bringing that to light and connecting through that is a, yeah, a, re a really nice kind of, uh, kind of segue into what we're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge gamer, so I, that's why part of the reason why I'm in this space and I'm all about it. Um, but I, I honestly want to see like um, a battle royale style, like a Fortnite, where, you know, we all pay up some magic or something like that before we uh, enter into the arena and whoever is the winner and gets all the magic. That's, that's, yeah. that's what I, I want to see at some point, you know, like, cause we all know how to play FPS games and, you know, I, I honestly think that Fortnite is going to do it at some point. I think that Epic games, I think they know, that they can do it and i think it's only a matter of time and i know that it's probably you know there's a whole lot of regulations beyond that too especially when you have like 13 year old kids playing your game and younger even but you know i think that that would just be like so much fun and exciting and when you talk about quake it's like you know yeah i understand you're playing on servers with people the people who are playing quake right now have to be super good at it because if they haven't moved on to like the newer the newer games then they must have really like excelled at it. <laughs> yeah, or, or they're just getting stomped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like uh, like uh, most of most of us, we uh, you know jump straight off the the side as soon as we spawn, kind of thing. <laughs> just kind of trying to reorient your the controls. It's quite it's quite funny, but I think like one of the biggest challenges for, like traditional games coming in, like for someone like an Epic Games. Um, so I feel like you know they definitely have the resources to do that. They definitely have the distribution to do that as well. It's just going to be a classic like innovators dilemma. So, you know, they've got a, um, a business model where they're making enormous amounts of money. Um, and so to, to disrupt themselves, um, to move into Web3 where you're kind of handing control back to the player um, in a lot of ways will be a massive call. Like just knowing how a lot of boardrooms operate, uh, that would be a very brave um, set of board members to, to basically say, hey, we're going to turn off our cash cow right now. Just when it started, uh, we're going to move to this um, new technology called blockchain when there's like lots of mass media still saying that it's a scam and it's a Ponzi uh, and that's not even going into NFTs itself. Lots of this value back to uh, the player. I just, I struggle to see that happening uh, anytime soon just because I know how like corporates work, which gives a lot of ground up um, opportunities uh, to people native in Web3 because we're not hamstrung like that. Like there's no real board constructs. Actually, that's been one of the most fascinating things kind of operating in this space is like the level of diligence that occurs uh, on some of these projects is uh, pretty loose, <laughs> I would have to say. Uh, coming from the traditional world where I've done, like, I've been on the diligent side. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and that definitely makes a lot of sense, you know, and I, I love the, the viewpoint that you have about, about that because that's definitely not uh, the way I saw it. Because at least for me, you know, I think that, you know, if you just look at 
what projects take in in terms of transaction fees or royalties or something like that. I think there's so much opportunity to not only create or earn capital just by moving to the blockchain and having people transact on your blockchain. And I think that's that's really what generates value is the uh, the activity on your blockchain. Like the more activity there is, the more value you're going to have in that system, right? And not just for the users, but for the creators as well, right? You can set some of your parameters in terms of like, well, if you do this, you know, a portion of the fees are going to go to this treasury kind of thing. So, and, and granted, treasure is all about the free mints and, you know, not being that way. So I understand that and I respect that too. But I think that, you know, there is there is an opportunity for those boardroom people to still make their money if they wanted to, but not that I want them to. <laughs> yeah. But I understand I, I, I understand what you're saying about the due diligence due diligence as well. It's it's definitely more off the cuff, loosey goosey kind of thing. Yeah, and I think it just comes with a risk reward profile as well. I think if you were to apply the same uh, kind of risk criteria to traditional world, I mean you'd never invest in anything. <laughs> um <laughs> True. <laughs> you'd um you'd be investing in a very very small portion um of, of people, which I don't think you get the diversity um of what you'd want to get in like a portfolio construction of what is you know a very kind of high frontier um new tech space. So like just with the territory comes high risk, and that's why people are willing to take on on this risk. And obviously like stuff like the UST meltdown uh, kind of changes that a lot. Like there's going to be a lot more risk management, I suspect, across the board. Uh, across all funds uh, and anyone deploying capital, but it's probably a good thing, to be honest. Um, Yeah, I I was just (laughs) going to say that that's that's definitely a good thing. Yeah, and I think we need to go through these types of exercises too, just to establish those kind of risk profiles or um, cautionary tales, if you will, you know? So it's like, hey, we tried this, it didn't work, so now we have to be better and protect ourselves against this kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Completely, um, completely agree on that. So you are one of the co-founders of Treasure Dow. Uh, what's your typical day to day like? Are you just interacting with different projects and just giving uh, guidance, or do you have, you know, like, are you running meetings? Like, I mean, I'm not a founder of anything except the Magic Hour podcast, so all I do is kind of coordinate what we do. But you know, what what's your day like? Yeah, good question. It's changed like quite a bit since I first started, just because my my roles evolved. I think um, over time as we got larger, so. You know, whereas before when I first started, um, I was a lot more kind of hands-on, um, particularly around like, you know, mechanism design and just, you know, speaking to, um, I, say, I think, individuals um, and just kind of projects, trying to get them off the ground, like very kind of partnerships oriented. I think as we scaled up, um, I had to move more towards, for lack of a better word, like corporate functions, <laughs> to be honest, and um, like management, ops, uh, to a certain extent uh, as well. And I was doing a lot of comms. For a long time i think like with all startups you invariably have all hats on uh you kind of have to get your hands dirty um do a little bit of everything um and you know fortunately i've had some experience obviously like i'm not a technical person so uh, i could only take that kind of so far but you know to the extent that i could help out on stuff that i have experience on uh like you know raising so kind of leading uh all that kind of divestment originally that we had kind of running that now kind of with corel kind of going forward um, got loads of experience that we can kind of tap into some of the bigger partnerships, obviously, I'm still kind of running a lot of that stuff, like with Strider, um, running the commercial kind of negotiations, basically bringing a lot of the skill sets that I had from the traditional world into Treasure. So it's like from a day-to-day basis, it really does depend uh, on what it is. But like, you know, most of it will be very like top line kind of partnership oriented, trying to scale the team up, trying to get the right processes in place, trying to make sure that like we actually, you know, sit up in a way that um, the team can scale. Uh, so it's really enabling, helping enable the team to do what they do best. It's the, probably the best way to kind of encapsulate it. I, I, lo- I love that answer because I would say that some of the best leaders that I've worked with are the ones that encourage the people who work for them to be independent and to make good decisions and empower them to build your vision, so to speak. And so I'm happy to hear that you know you're kind of like, not leading from the front, but leading from behind, if you will. I think that's, you know, the way they describe it. And uh, I, I can appreciate that. And I think that's really good quality. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I mean, look, I, I'm not sure about the others, but like definitely myself, I don't see myself as a boss of anyone, um, honestly. Um, you no, know, just because I was there like near the start doesn't mean anything really. Um, in my mind, like anyone 
um, can kind of plug in and pick it up. Like, you know, N came in halfway through. I mean, he was there from the start, like obviously farming, like um, like a lot of the, the people were, but, you know, he kind of came in and he's plugged in like really seamlessly. Like same with Peter, um, same with Carell. Like Carell came in a bit after, but he's come in, uh, picked off where um, we kind of were and he's been amazing just in terms of like elevating the quality, um, just generally speaking across so many different facets. So yeah, there's no like, oh, I'm, I'm the boss, I kind of direct stuff. It's more conversations with peers, with colleagues, um, with co-contributors. We may have like stronger views on particular aspects, but that's fine. Like if someone doesn't agree with you, you just have a conversation around it. Uh, so that, that's generally how I kind of uh, approach it. But my kind of thing is like enablement, get out of their way, allow people to do what they need to do. I'm like pretty confident that we've got the strongest team that we've had since we've started. Since kind of day one, we've got like really great talent across the board. Uh, as I kind of mentioned before, just getting to this point was really hard uh, and getting people to gel together uh, is so hard to do. Like just uh, understanding that part, like if, if you've ever managed a team before um, and I don't mean like, oh, hey, I'm your boss, it's just like coordinating a team. It's really hard. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's very hard. I understand. I have experience in a startup. I have an understand. I, I understand what it means when you have a team member that might bring the whole team down or, you know. Uh, sometimes there's a boulder in the stream and you got to get rid of the boulder for the stream to flow kind of well, so to speak. But um, I just want to say that two two things. One, I love Corel's addition to the, to the treasure team. I feel like he's been almost a, a breath of fresh air. Not to say that you guys aren't great, but he's really kind of shown to be a really great kind of leader and communicator and giving the people what they want and addressing the concerns very like head on in in the right way. So I really appreciate him being there. And then the other thing is I really miss end from like before or like early on in treasure, because I feel like he doesn't even hang out in the one that much anymore, but he was one of the people who I, who always, you know, brought humor to uh, our discord that we're in. We're in this, the one, if you will, is the name of the Discord server, but um, he doesn't come around as much anymore, and I miss that. But I'm sure he's doing great for Treasure, and I'm glad to hear that he's fit in so nicely. So that's good for him, and, and you know, we support him 100%, uh, and yeah, he supports us too, but um, I miss him. I definitely. miss the old end, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think um, like all of us are kind of facing this. Um, like When you start anything in Web3, it's just full on. It's 24-7. It never switches off. And mm -hmm. it's really hard to adjust to that. Um, and I, I know having spoken to a lot of people in the team, that's been quite confronting. Uh, and just just the persistent, uh, I guess, feedback, noise, commentary on everything you do. It's like, you know, you're a politician or you're something like executive. You're constantly in the, in the limelight and you're just getting peppered with comments <laughs> about what you're doing nonstop. Yeah. Uh, good and bad, you just, you just got to ride with it. Um, you got to kind of put your blinders on to some extent. Um, but yeah, it can be pretty uh, confronting, I think, for people who are not used to that environment. Uh, so now I would just say to those people who have like comments, like just be kind of aware, like we're all human, we're all people. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like words can be quite powerful. Uh, and so like what could be off the cuff remark or just you having a rant can have like a pretty serious impact on someone's mental health because it is red uh, and like it's, it's hard to detach yourself from that. Um, so, like it, it does have an impact on people. So just be aware of that. Um, like words are powerful, so uh, just be conscious of kind of mental health. But yeah, on the on the Corel front, he's amazing. He's actually based like he I think he was working part time for a while. I actually think he was like he was, thought he was a robot for a while, just because like the amount of productivity <laughs> the guy was producing was like phenomenal. I was like, holy shit, he's actually still doing his other job <laughs> while he's doing this. I I don't actually see how this is feasible. Um, and so we're like, well, if we get him on full time, this is going to be unstoppable. And he has been unstoppable since he joined. Um, he, he really has like, elevated treasure to a new level, uh, which we need to get to, professional, but with all the kind of uh, keeping the true kind of grassroots kind of Web3 culture. I think the other person is kind of Peter. He does a lot of the stuff behind the scenes that no one really sees, but he is like an absolute machine. Like, yeah, I really enjoyed talking with Peter when we had the, him and N on with the, for the Bridge World Questing 2.0 episode. You know, I think that he really showed his uh, acumen in what, what he was doing with Web3. So I agree with you there. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, you'd spoken about N's, N's uh, amazing, kind of stepping in, um, not having like a necessarily a background in that, but just being able to take it the, uh, the extent that he has has been um, phenomenal. And then, like, um, you know, uh, we've got amazing people like X uh, as well, just on the community front, just covering the amount that he does, keeping 
um, all the kind of the mods um, across everything is, you know, I think mods generally are the kind of the forgotten kind of face of a lot of these communities. They do an amazing uh, job. Like our mods are, um, are awesome. Uh, I know if you kind of go into other discords, like you get a pretty mixed bag with our mods, but I'd say like ours are like, I'd say pretty well educated on what the project is, can talk, you know, with a lot of thoughtfulness around like what's actually happening. Uh, and, you know, we definitely don't take that for granted. They do uh, an amazing job. So we're extremely thankful um, for them. Uh, and then probably the last person like is Vinny. Uh, Vinny is like our kind of uh, one of our main consolidated devs. He is an absolute beast. Like he, he's definitely like one of those uh, unique people who can do the, the work of like 10 to 20 people um, in the same amount of time. So yeah, the, lots of unsung heroes for sure. And I, I've missed lots of people. So. One thing that you mentioned before when you were talking about the, the CSGO secondary marketplace was, I, I like how you put it, you said that some of the corporate guys tried to retrofit the corporate world into Web3. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And I wanted to understand how you have kind of tried to balance your background at, at, and like business acumen um, in the corporate world while also kind of managing this new frontier of Web3 and, and working with kind of more of a globalized team. I understand that that's kind of a, a large question, so you can answer that with any level of depth that you would prefer. Yeah, sure. No, it's a great question. It's it's, it's quite um, funny. Like, you know, Andrew and I, so Andrew Green from Strider, he comes from like a various Steam's kind of Web2, um, AAA studio, um, and like even fun to a certain extent. And, you know, he did some time at A16Z. Like, we were kind of commenting on this, like when we were pulling the, you know, the, the commercials together that you know, traditionally the way that they would approach it would be like a very structured but very gougy way, to be honest, because like we've done, we've cut these deals before um, and just the way that they set up how funds move around, like particularly to whoever has, you know, the negotiating leverage is extremely lopsided and it hardly ever um, aligns uh, in terms of like long-term incentives. And that's like one of the hard things like I, I generally found as well, like in, uh, in the real world, a lot of the times partnerships are really just a marketing tool because like delivering a partnership properly is exceptionally hard and their incentives usually never align, which is why you always see like these JVs fall apart over time because actually what they want is they want to build their core. Uh, they don't necessarily want to build the side business. And if the side business gets too big, then they have some really challenging decisions they need to make. They either buy it out completely, so bring all the equity uh, and the value in-house, or they have to kill it in some way, shape or form. And so that's kind of one of the things that's uh, been quite interesting. Like partnerships is, uh, you know, <laughs> definitely very powerful if done right, but the incentives need to be aligned from day one. I think like with Web3, you are able to do that. And as long as you approach it with the right mindset uh, and not where it's obviously hey like i'm going to take all the value and you should just be fortunate enough to speak to us kind of approach which is a very kind of corporate way of thinking i.e like i monopolize whatever distribution channel or channel that i'm operating therefore you know you accept my turns or you go somewhere else kind of thing so just removing ourselves from that i think from the other kind of part of the question you're asking so one of the big things is i think like traditional companies and you see this with nfts for sure is that you get these people who are like, oh, it's a trend or it's hype. They take that to the board. It's like, oh, it's noisy. We can create some, uh, some vibe around this. Like, let's, let's go for it. But obviously they don't really know what it means, like the essence of it. And so you get a, like this complete disconnect because the people that they should be connecting with who actually will respond to that, they're not speaking to them at all. And instead they're actually just putting together like a very Web2 oriented marketing plan to like the Web2 users, but they're actually trying to sell them Web3. And <laughs> so they're selling them the wrong product which is why like there's hardly any like uptick at all in that. It's no surprise actually when you take a step back. And so like the retrofitting is, hey, I've got a product that already exists in Web2. Why don't I just jam Web3 into it and hope that it works? And that's usually like the playbook for existing companies. It's like, you know, you've got this user base. Maybe it's pretty lightweight. I'll just see if I can uh, get some, uh, you know, interactivity with, uh, with NFTs because it's cool, but they haven't really thought about like how can I actually unlock the true value of, of, of kind of Web3 kind of thinking? And so we've seen lo loads of that uh, for now, but they'll get smarter over time for sure. Um, and you'll get more natives, like Web3 natives, join those companies because unlike a lot of people just like, oh, uh, I'm very anti-Web2, there are loads of great brands that exist. We operate with them day to day. They're phenomenal products. Yes, maybe uh, they're monopolistic in the way that they take their profits, but at the end of the day, they create great products and we enjoy using them. Um, they, there is... A lot to be kind of said around their ability to continue to make great products and like the you know the 
the profit kind of construct that they've been able to kind of create. Not sure how that actually plays out in a true, like very principle oriented kind of Web3 world where everyone's, you know, pure competition. There's like hardly any margin anywhere because everyone's just operating on the, the level playing field. I don't, I'm not sure we'll ever get to that, to be honest. I kind of feel like that's quite idealistic. Invariably, you will get people who do create an advantage, a competitive advantage. And they, in my mind, they should, you know, they should be able to have some benefit from that. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of a uh, race to the bottom in some ways. Not to say like open source shouldn't be the way. I definitely think it should be. But, you know, if you're going to put all the effort in to build something, there should be some benefit associated with that. What that looks like, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Like that's still getting played out. Definitely is not like 90% margins. But at the same time, it can't be like nothing because then what's the incentive for anyone to build anything together? Um, so it's somewhere in the middle, just not sure what that is. Absolutely. And I, I, I kind of want to have a follow-up to the, the first part of this question. You, you mentioned working with Strider. And one thing I want to know is what excites you the most about working with the Strider team? Yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we at Treasure wanted to do and we kind of reflected back on like the broader strategy is that like you only really need one or two really good games to pull enough attention and mindshare in to supercharge an ecosystem. Right? That, that's all you kind of need. And we've had a lot of great community oriented games um, who kind of pop up. I mean, Battlefly has been amazing, uh, kind of what Ben's been able to do, kind of turning that from kind of nothing into, you know, a 20 to 30 um, person team with a high fidelity game in that amount of time is phenomenal. Like the, the Knights of the um, Ether guys as well are doing awesome stuff. Uh, any like Tales of Illyria uh, is another one, just like they're on the right path, but all this stuff takes time, right? And like, if you kind of take a step back, well, actually, I mean, Knights of the Ether, I think they do have a game studio, but for the most part, a lot of these community oriented projects do not have proper game designers or game studio experience behind them. And to put it bluntly, it's a hobby for most people. Like, they actually don't have any experience and we still want to encourage people to create and build together. And so we, we definitely don't want to discourage that. And I think we're going to see some real gems there. But like probability is going to suggest that most of these are going to fail, like honestly, and that's and we just have to be comfortable with that. Um, and that's just going to happen. It's just that's what real life is going to. That's how it works, uh, and you, people just have to accept that. No one knows which one's going to succeed or fail, by the way. But like, we just have to kind of accept that. I've accepted that because I've I've seen that play out so many times. Um, and so why we're excited about Strata is we're not kind of placing all our eggs in one basket, but they are people from proper gaming backgrounds. Like they know how the industry works. They know how to develop a game end to end. They know the go to market. Like go to market is one area that most people in crypto have zero idea about. Like they have marketing and their marketing is, hey, let's go let's talk to an influencer and just shill, shill the shit out of this and then dump our bags or it just ends there. Versus like a really thoughtful, well thought out plan around like how do I actually take this product to market? What are the channels? Who are the partners? Like how do I actually make this stick? And there's a lot of thought behind running a business at scale that you know crypto people i think discount because it's it's you know it's web 2 but there's a lot of stuff that works in web 2 uh and which we need to kind of bring forward the professionalism aspect so it's really having people who have worked in the space experts in what they do have some really kind of cool ideas around how to make it work but at the same time are very open uh to kind of the web 3 way of working uh, and want to make it work so they're not retrofitting anything they want to take you know web 3 principles and they're very open uh, and, you know, you would have seen that in the chat with uh, Andrew and the team as well. They're very candid uh, around the kind of approach and open to that as well. So they're not kind of fixated on like it must be X, Y, Z way. If there's a, a different way to approach it because it's Web3 and it's new, by all means, let's, let's, let's chat it out. Let's kind of um, thrash out some ideas and see what works. So that, that's what I'm kind of most excited about, like a true kind of Web3 native kind of game being built on, on Treasure is uh, like it's pretty exciting. It, it is exciting. And, I, you know, it touches on what I said earlier that there's just so many projects building in the treasure ecosystem wanting to integrate with treasure that we're going to have gems we're going to have failures it's, it's going to it's bound to happen but i love that everybody's coordinating kind of and wants to help each other out and wants to kind of overlap and and help each other build something and and maybe all these projects that everybody are building are actually just one big project at the end of the day who knows but when they come to you guys what kind of qualities and projects are you looking for when they want to integrate with the treasure ecosystem? And this is more for the, like the builders out there who haven't really kind of gotten anywhere yet or have an idea and inkling of something. And they're like, you know, maybe I want to do this. Maybe they hear this and they're like, oh, you know, this fits into my, my narrative, my, my goal kind of thing. No, it's a good question. I mean, we've tried to take a bit of a, I guess, a traditional framework, but we've uh, like, we've augmented it um, for more kind of like a web three kind of nature. So, you know, 
creating out some, I guess, a set of criteria that we'd be looking for. I think, you know, it's in its early stages, so we're refining it over time. But similar to a lot of these businesses you would approach kind of in the, in the real world or assessing kind of opportunities in the real world, kind of similar approach to that. So team is a massive factor to us, like the quality of the team, the fact that you actually have one. So it's more than just like one person with an idea on a napkin. Unfortunately, like ideas are quite cheap, right? And it's like there are good ideas and there are terrible ideas and you don't know where they're going to go. Some may sound terrible, but then they turn out to be great. Um, but to the extent that we're, you know, giving magic emissions to people, like we have to de-risk on, on behalf of the DAO. And so there are certain things that we just can't take risks on because it's too early, right? And so it's not really for us to say, hey, that's an idea that's not really going to work, but, you know, take a bit more time to build this out, flesh it out, actually get a team together. Um, actually build something because I feel like there's a lot of people and I, look, I fall into this bucket. It's like, hey, I got this idea, but I have no one to actually build it. And I suspect I fall into people. that bucket. I yeah, fall into exactly. that bucket. Definitely. It's really, it's actually really hard. It's like, I got this idea, um, like what can I do with it? Um, and right. actually one of these things that hopefully we can do with this network that you're in is like be able to connect people with devs of all kinds, front end, back end, Solidity, like the whole gamut, like UX UI, um, because there are people with amazing ideas or just ideas, but they just need to thrash it out with other people. And that's how you kind of come up with these gems. It's like you connect like-minded people who really want to build stuff uh, and then they'll come up with some like pretty amazing things. Um, so that's kind of one team is just like a, a big one. This next one is like a little bit of a hard one. It's like proof points that they've actually had a history in building. I tend to find like a lot of people in this space and you kind of touched on it. It's nothing to do with age necessarily, but they just don't have that much experience. And it's a little bit of like, it's a catch-22 because you have to start somewhere. So invariably, there has to be an occasion where you have no experience and you're trying something. <laughs> so, um, right. But it's like, it's like the entry-level job, you know? It's like <laughs> you, need, you want to get the entry-level job, but they want to have three, three years' experience. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How is this going to work? So we, we kind of grapple with that sometimes as well. It's like, okay, potentially this idea could go somewhere, but there's really no proof points of you being able to deliver anything. And just knowing the complexity, um, it's actually delivering something, executing something is extremely hard. Like everyone, like anyone who's done that knows that. Just the coordination, actually building stuff, getting end to end, building a delightful experience, uh, that's phenomenally hard. So, you know, full kudos to anyone who's actually done that and done that well. So just kind of thinking through like, do they have a, a track record of being able to do this? Um, like that's just another factor. And then I think like another big one is obviously like product market fit to a certain extent. But this is less around like there needs to be a fit right now, but more um, have they actually put a lot of thoughtfulness into what it is. So I think invariably what happened was there was just a lot of like Me Too products that came along. They were essentially just like the same thing, um, but with a new skin. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just like a staking game. And look, yeah. I think now for like low fidelity, that's, that's fine. You kind of have to do that. So we understand that, like crawl, walk, run uh, to, to a certain extent. Because like, otherwise you'd be doing the traditional route, which is you get lots of PC funding or funding of some kind, build out the game and you wouldn't release it for much longer. So... I totally get like the, you know, start small, staking first, then move into something a little bit more high fidelity, and then maybe go into something like full fidelity where you're actually moving around. So I, I totally get that. But the base mechanics of what some projects were kind of doing were, you know, pretty much the same as what everyone else was doing. So it's just kind of unpacking that uh, and getting people to kind of think through a little bit more deeply around like how this is actually going to work. And then again, I was kind of mentioning like the go to market side, like how well have they actually thought through who they're targeting uh, and why, like how are they actually going to reach these people? Why are they going to want to engage with you um, versus everyone else out there? Because it's cutthroat and it's cutthroat even within Treasure, it's cutthroat within Arbitrum and then it's cutthroat in, you know, across all the different L2, L1s um, out there. So like how are you going to create, like capture mindshare? Treasure already struggles enough as it is to do that. So how are you going to do that in isolation? Um, and then the next one is like the actual game mechanism and economy itself. So. Definitely varying levels of kind of thought go into this. And it can be a pretty technical area. So, you know, again, we're very lucky to have someone like Peter on board to kind of help people who kind of progress to that stage that he can kind of help them um, unpack that to a certain extent. You know, how, how thoughtful is the, the actual game design in this such that, you know, everyone wants to avoid a farm and dump, but have they actually thought that through? Like, what does it actually mean to them, particularly to the extent they want magic uh, emissions as well? Because, you know, invariably you get a lot of people who's like, hey, just give us lots of emissions, but we haven't really thought through like, how do we retain that um, in the game? And how do we kind of mitigate against people just farming and dumping, um, which is what we, I think, collectively don't want to happen in the broader ecosystem. So, and I don't think there's an easy answer necessarily to that. Uh, and a lot of it is kind of test and learn. So that's just one thing that we kind of look at. I, I agree with you. I agree with you because it's really hard to 
eliminate the farm and dump behavior because people want to turn what they earn into something that they can retain as wealth, right? And, you know, if they don't feel that the token that they've earned is valuable enough, they're going to turn into either a stable coin or to Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that. And I see this with almost every project in DeFi. And even even with like, um, you know, I, I like, and this is outside the treasury ecosystem, but I like this project Steppen, right? The move to earn, you know, you run and you earn tokens for running. And even that one, you know, people are earning the tokens and they're selling it into USDC, even though there are a ton of sinks. I think it's a very difficult challenge for anyone in this space. So don't feel bad that you guys are, you know, experiencing it just the same way everybody else is. And maybe you don't feel that way, but, you know, I... My impression is that people are selling magic. Well, maybe not now because the price is depressed. But, you know, I think that it's just, it's what everybody's experiencing across DeFi. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face in the coming months or years as we build out this space to understand how do we prevent people from doing that? Well, you have to generate enough value in that ecosystem that people are going to want to own that token as much as they want to sell it kind of thing. Do I have yeah. that right? Um. Yeah, no, and I, like, I, I don't have the answer to this, but it, it's kind of the same, you know, similar kind of thinking to us. I think it also kind of comes down to like what the underlying product is. So like, what do you actually want people to engage with and why? Um, like, why are you bringing them in there? Because if actually by extension, your product is really just about farming, then of course they're going to dump it. Like you actually, you've nearly set up a construct for them to do that. And it doesn't really matter like whatever sinks you put in there. And one of the overarching reasons why they're using uh, whatever system, project, game um, that you're creating is to make money. Um, and they are going to have to cash out at some stage. So I guess that's kind of why some people say, well, it's just a Ponzi um, in, in some ways. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Uh, it just kind of depends on like what the product is there for. Again, you just have to kind of take a couple extra steps into the product design kind of question. Because if you invariably just end up with and then the user sells, well, then you shouldn't be surprised that the user is selling. Uh, it's just like a, it's a balancing act. You just have to see, do we have enough people who actually want to play the game? If it's a game, for example, versus just selling, then you can probably kind of balance it out. But there's always going to be a portion of people who are there who are financially incentivized. As long as it's crypto, I don't see that kind of changing unless you have like a non-transferable token. Uh, you know, we do that with kind of toads, which has been like really successful actually in doing that. But there's still, you know, uh, an extra strip you can do to to cash that out into some form of monetary value. And I think that's just the hard part, you know, with NFTs as well. It has a monetary value. I, it's really hard to, to see that changing for as long as there's speculation involved. Well, I, I, just, I, yeah. I think it comes with iteration. I think that we're exploring the way these things work and we're coming up with ways to interact financially that we've never thought of before because we never had an opportunity to attach data to uh, something of value like this. And I think, you know, when, when Vitalik talks about soul bound tokens, it's like, wow, that's something that no one ever really kind of considered before, but well, what can we do with this? And we're going to probably see a lot of exploration maybe within that, so to speak. So I think that, you know, like it's, you know, we, we're doing a lot of learning and kind of creating value out of the building that we're doing, but it's also a, a very broad learning experience. I don't want to use the word experiment because I don't think it's an experiment. I think it's a movement more than anything else. But I think that, uh, you know, you know, we're going to have to try things that may work and may don't, but there's a lot of risk taking. And I think that's good. I think that's good. Um, you know, I, I know that we've been talking for a long time and I have really enjoyed this conversation. I, I do have just one last question. I think that uh, the listeners are definitely going to be interested in this. You know, we've covered a lot of topics, but you're the, one of the leaders of the Treasure DAO. What are you most excited about within the Treasure DAO ecosystem that maybe hasn't been released yet? It doesn't have to be a treasure project, a, a bridge world project. It could be something else. But what are you kind of looking forward to or what has kind of piqued your interest where like, oh, this is very interesting. I want to follow this kind of thing. Yeah, good question. I think, you know, from a pure personal level, I kind of really just want to have a really fun game to play, <laughs> honestly. Um, that's, <laughs> Me too. That's, Me too. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. 
um, you know, so removing the like the financial aspects to it. It's like how when we finally find that kind of <laughs> that perfect kind of uh, cross of all these factors, the stars align, where we actually come up with this genuinely fun game um, that somehow balances like, the financial kind of construct to it, whether that's just by earning an asset that allows you to play in the game, doesn't necessarily need to be anything relating to yield or like this ongoing income stream that people like to kind of associate with it because I, I feel like that gets you into a really tight bind if you go down too far down that path. But mm -hmm. I just want to be able to play a really fun game that's built on treasure. That's, I'd be like pretty satisfied if we can nail that because if we can nail that, then I feel like we've, we've probably solved a lot of the other problems as well because we've probably onboarded a whole ton of people around that. We've probably mm -hmm. built out a whole bunch of infrastructure to enable that. Um, we've probably broken down quite a lot of the barriers um, as well um of like traditional gamers so that's kind of the the big thing for me honestly i love that answer and and just a quick follow up what's what's your like favorite game what's your go-to i know you're playing quake right now with the, with the team but like what's what's the one that's like you go back to you're like i love this game this this was what what got me like hooked it's kind of funny but like i have not had a great deal of time to play as much as like mm -hmm. as i would have so there's like a couple of, um, I've been a massive FIFA um, player for like a long time. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I'm a big, I'm a big football, football fan. Um, that's kind of one just because like, you know, nice. it's the whole camaraderie playing with your friends and, right. and you know, just the shit talking. <laughs> um, of course. And of course, uh, Smash Brothers. So from Smash Brothers Melee, um, back from the kind of GameCube days. Uh, and then like, I'm an old like uh, kind of Pokemon <laughs> guy as well um, from way back when. Pokemon's one of the original RPGs, I guess you could say. Dion, I mean, I don't know if we've ever had this question. What, what's one of your favorite games? The the game that I play the most currently is League of Legends. It's a terrible time sink. Outside of that, I think growing up, my favorite game was either Super Smash Brothers Melee or the Halo series. That came out as I was growing up, and I love that. Halo, Halo was fantastic. Yeah. I think that for for me, I think what really got me caught up in gaming was it might have even been you know wolfenstein and and i'm oh, dating myself for sure yeah. <laughs> i was playing the i was playing the original wolfenstein and something called spear of destiny like that was nice. like the, one of the original id software games and doom obviously but so i played Fortnite for like yeah. maybe a year and a half because i like that too i i like the idea of like a king of the hill battle arena kind of style and i think Garp, when you're talking about I want to just play a fun game, I think that's I think it comes down to something like that where you you have an entry fee to just get into the game, and once once you get in, you forget about the crypto piece and you just focus on the game. And then you know, like if the reward at the end is something from crypto, that's great, you know. But I think that's where you can kind of like bring it in because it's just you know you're utilizing the crypto as a means to get into the game to play it one time rather than you buy the software and just have it forever. You know, now we, you're paying for that one use of the software at that time kind of thing. At least that's something that I think about. And I think about this often. Yeah. And just to like kind of play on that, like you mean, mentioned League of Legends. Um, I was kind of more into kind of Dota myself. Actually, my wife yeah, got yeah. me into that. <laughs> I'm into nice. Dota a bit. I think um, like uh, one of the biggest things that like crypto has not tapped into from the gaming front, and I feel like it's like the untapped gem is free to play so no yeah. one has really done free to play properly um in crypto because everyone's so focused on like you actually need to have money and invest in it because everyone right. just wants to make more money but mm -hmm. i think if someone can crack properly the free to play sphere uh, in a crypto game like that's how you onboard like the next wave and it's probably going to be mobile native to be honest so like mobile native free to play uh and then you're going to get like a shit ton of users it's my um, kind of opinion on that. As long as you can get rid of like the, the Web 2, Web 3 kind of UX integration, um, I can kind of see that as like one of the massive frontiers uh, of onboarding uh, the next set of users. Garb, this was fantastic. Exceeded my expectations. And so I, w I really want to thank you for, for coming on and, and for sharing your thoughts. And, uh, you know, we're really grateful to have you in this space because I think you have the right frame of mind for sure to be a leader. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for you. your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been great. And that concludes another episode of Magic Hour, friends. 
If you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to our YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you can listen to your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Magic Hour Pod. All the links are found on our link tree, which is in the show notes. From all of us, we appreciate your support for Bridge World. Bridge World.